welcome uh, to this presentation, which will be given by Olaf Hartung, and he's a defensive specialist and security researcher at Falcon Force. Uh, the presentation is IDR internals from a defender's perspective, and Olaf will tell more about that. Uh, just to remind about the rules, this is TLP White session. Uh, please switch off your mobile phones so that we don't get any uh, unpleasant noises during the presentation. And uh, after the session, please do fill in the evaluation on the mobile app to show how do you uh, like the presentation. Thank you very much, and Olaf, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Let me just set my own timer. So good morning, everyone. Thanks for making it up. Um, just a brief introduction to add to it. So um, my name is Olaf Hartong, uh, as mentioned before. I work at Falcon Force, and one of the things that we do, and I don't want to make this into a sales talk, but we primarily focus on a lot of detection engineering, a lot of research, and a lot of offensive work. And that's also why we started digging into EDRs, because that's what everybody uses or should use, just to figure out what it's capable of and how we can uh, make it uh, useful for us as a, as a defender, but also from an attacker perspective to understand how can we bypass it and detect that again. Um, so I have a broad background in all kinds of threat hunting, IR, and these kind of things you can read. Um, I went to art school, so I never studied computer science, and that, nor should you, but it would help. Um, I'm father of two boys, and of course I like warm hugs for the people that have seen Frozen. I really like Disney for that. Um, so what can you expect from this talk? So I'll generally talk about Defender for Endpoint. Uh, from Microsoft, um, I'm an also an MVP, I'm not a uh, commercial vehicle, uh, because it will be a critical talk. Um, but this applies to every EDR, technically, right? So there might be differences and all kinds of things, but the whole, the whole way they work are generally the same. Um, so I started looking at what kind of telemetry does it bring you, what can you do with it, um, where does it come from, which is also very important, also from an attacker perspective, because you might have a separate set of telemetry that you want to augment to it, just to make sure that you have it. Um, it's configured, so we also want to show a little, know a little bit what, what it's actually doing, how it's getting its information, and then I have a wrap up, and if I go too fast, I have backup slides uh, for some additional fun. So first of all, what, what can you do with it, right? So it's a, it's a sort of all-in-one trying to be solution, uh, XDR, whatever, um, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it has a couple of components, uh, and, and the most important ones are AV, um, and attack service reduction, which is sort of part of the operating system as well, so it's, it, it ties into each other, but it doesn't necessarily have to bo be bought. Uh, you have exploit guard, application control, there's of course the EDR component that is cloud-based. Um, there, is, there is some incident response capability where you can live connect to a host, do some memory dumps, some, some small analysis things, get some artifacts. Um, it does do some vulnerability management or scanning. Um, there's a network sensor, it has DOP capabilities, it can even scan networks, these kind of things. So it's, it's being expanded constantly. Um, just use whatever you like. So the AV component, of course, is embedded already in the operating system that just ingests the alerts into the, the EDR product. Uh, of course, it's very signature-based, uh, as every EDR mostly does. Um, it does do also some cloud-based analysis of the samples that it can upload if you allow it to. And if you want to pick a little bit more uh, into what the capabilities of the signature database are, there's a, a, a great research project from Camille Mugi, probably butchering his name, sorry. He works for the France, French ANSI, um, and he basically found a way to, to, uh, to uh, uh, decrypt the whole database. Um, so a couple of things that you should be aware of. Of course, you can exclude stuff from AV, like, like sh sometimes should be useful. Um, but this is also something that attackers will at least try immediately when they hit a box. So definitely make sure you monitor that. Um, and there, there are some couple of quirks where you can also ex exclude a process, for instance. But it won't exclude that process. It will exclude the child of that process. So if you want to have a certain tree that you don't want to see being caught, then you should, yeah address that accordingly, and if you exclude something, then it's only excluded for the AV, which is kind of nice, because then still the EDR and all the other uh, components will apply to it. So if you want to exclude it there, you have to make multiple exclusions. Um, and if you really want to see how it works, there's a couple of tools. So you have Defender Check, which is a tool uh, uh, that I sometimes use if I want to see why it triggered on something. So 
it, it didn't used to be, but now it's also detected by the AV because they think it's a malicious tool. So you can use defender check to check on defender check to check on defender, sort of weird, weird deep dive. But basically what you can see is, is the, uh, the bit that the AV engine triggered on. And then if you're a malware developer, you could change a bit of that code. Usually it's a bit of string or a comment. Um, and you might be able to bypass the AV that way. It's just to understand a little bit. Um, also, if you have a legitimate tool, why it triggered, and you might be able to talk to the uh, developers. Uh, other component is the attack service reduction one. And this is uh, built in, as I mentioned, just into Windows 10 and up. And it's a super powerful feature. So there's like 16 rules for office uh, child, child processes and so on, um, which you should enable always. Um, but you can, you can configure them in blocking or audit mode. So in the beginning, definitely don't block uh, because you might break stuff and people will be mad. But um, the ones that you do think should be blocked, you can at least start enabling because it's, it's a really powerful way of making it harder for an attacker without too much hassle. Uh, so the graph that you see here is built by, by Palantir, a US company, and they basically had a sort of generic guidance into which ones should be safe for most companies and the rest you might want to investigate. Still, you want to also investigate the safe ones because you never know if it is different for you. And it's relatively easy to enable. It's just a couple of GPOs uh, that you can push uh, or registry keys via Intune or whatever you're using. So it's, uh, it's relatively safe. And again, this is also something that is slightly rule-based. So this is an extract, extract also from that same research uh, from Camille where they uh, have all kinds of Lua scripts that run uh, in the engine for the, uh, for the ASR rules. And I, I highlighted a couple where you can just see some are, are quite bad in a way because they, they just look at two folders in a whole path. So if you know this as an attacker, you can just create those two folders, drop your malware, and it will bypass this rule. It's still a little bit of fiddly, uh, but it, this is a way to bypass it. And, I, and Microsoft is working on addressing this to also look a little bit more uh, in a broader sense uh, than only pass command lines and file names. Um, but this is something to be aware of, right, as a defender. Another one is uh, the defender application control, which is an extremely powerful feature um, where you can basically uh, kill everything, anything on a box that you don't want there. Uh, and you can do that on, on all the attributes that are listed there. So it's, again, very powerful. There's a lot of great research by Matt Graeber on this. Something that you might want to look into. It's like application whitelisting. It's complicated. I have to grant that. But if you just have a lot, uh, there, there's a couple of lists even with malicious drivers and some stuff that you probably don't want on your systems. Just start with that. And maybe um, uh, use it only in audit mode again so that at least you have telemetry when you know something that you probably think is suspicious will, will be executed. And it, this also goes for driver loads and all kinds of other telemetry. So if you only rely on your native event logs and your EDR, you might want to augment it with this. And then, of course, the EDR telemetry is there, right? So this is probably the gist of, of where an EDR becomes powerful. Um, and in the Defender for Endpoint case, uh, it relies primarily on the sense service, which is a uh, service that runs on your Windows box, and it gathers all kinds of events and ships it off to the cloud where it gets analyzed, and then if they find something, they push it back and block it. Um, and all of those events uh, are basically stored in a advanced hunting table, uh, as they call it, which is basically a log analytics workspace on Azure uh, that you can query with the Gusto language. And a couple of things to note is basically the most important one is which the events that are logged and visible is controlled uh, by Microsoft. And they, they control that configuration. You can't say, hey, I'm interested in the registry key and I don't see it yet. Too bad. Yeah, you can ask them, right? So you can, you can open a ticket, request it uh, with a reason, and it's, it's relatively likely that they'll do it, but they don't do it tomorrow. It might take a couple of months depending on the backlog. So this is something to take into account. And then another one that is very important, so some of those events are sampled or at least filtered. And the reason that they do that, and, and well, you can see which ones they are, but the reason probably why, or the primary reason is one, you pay a fixed amount per month for that service, so they have to sort of constrain their resource use, uh, which is probably the primary one. Um, the second one is, 
a lot of people don't even use the telemetry, so it's also a ways to store it. I think that's, that's both their reasons to do it. Um, and then, the, of course, there's some bandwidth restrictions that they want to keep it contained in a way. But um, generally, it's, it's okay. So, for instance, the network connections are, are heavily uh, uh, rate limited, so you usually get the first seen event of that day with a lot of fields. So it's, it's, relatively, uh, it's relatively okay, but you can't see beaconing or that kind of stuff. So be aware of that, because you m if you want to build a detection rule that looks for beaconing behavior, this is probably not your data source. Um, and it heavily relies on the, the event tracing for Windows as well. So I'll, I'll dig into that a little bit longer. Um, and they even generate their own uh, native uh, ETW events, which you might have a look at as well if you uh, start looking uh, for, for special events. <coughs> so, um, as I mentioned, so you pay per, per, per device or per user. A little bit depends if it's a server or a workstation. Um, and they, they keep the data in the cloud for you for 30 days. Um, and the marketing says 180 days, but that's basically the timeline. So they, they also make a sort of very condensed version of your already condensed uh, uh, telemetry. And you can query that for 180 days, but you can't query it with the query language. You have to use this search box or the portal, which isn't a very nice experience. And if you want it longer, you have to basically get it from the API, extract it, store it somewhere else. There's, there's plenty of ways to do it. There's all kinds of Azure solutions, but you can also get it to Splunk or whatever you're using locally, um, which, which would be a good idea because 30 days is nice, but if you have an incident, you generally want to look at, look at least uh, longer. Um, and on average, I think, I think this slide is a little bit outdated, but it's like 20 to 25 megabytes per device per day. So it's, it's yeah, it's not, it's not a lot, but it's also not very little. Um, um, depending on how active you want to be with that data, it's probably too little for you if you want to get a lot of it, but it's, it's storable. And then it's structured in a way that it's, it's, it's like a database, right? So there's tables, and then within the tab tables there, there is a schema with all kinds of fields. Um, and basically what you can do, you can query the, the, the interface itself, to tell, tell it to get the schema, and you get all the fields listed. Um, but that doesn't go to the depth that you want it, because what they do, for the, at least for the device events, is they have a sort of catch-all bucket where the action type is basically filled with, with that whole list and, and way more. I think there's 185 different action types in there now, and they go from those ASR events, uh, exploit guard, um, USB devices plugged in, but also, um, uh, for instance, uh, ELSA's dumping uh, is, is also in there. And then there's all kinds of additional fields tied to that event, which gives you all kinds of very nice JSON information, uh, which you can actually use in a detection. But keeping track of that is, is relatively difficult because they constantly onboard new information for you, but you're not necessarily notified of that. So one of the things that you can do, there's, a, there's this schema reference uh, guide in the portal where you can browse through it and see what is there, but nobody wants to scroll and then remember everything. So uh, what you can also do is just uh, uh, open the, the hacker tab with F12 and then basically get that uh, through the API. So you can get the API call that they do um, and basically build a very simple script where you can download it and do a diff and then you can build a Slack bot, for instance, that tells you every time they added some new data components, which is kind of nice because you want to be on top of what you can use. Um, out of the box, they generate all kinds of alerts. And this is nice, but you never know what they do. So what we try to do, and I deliberately share an old slide because I don't want to help anybody on the offensive side. Um, and since this is broadcast, I don't know who's, who's watching. But basically what we do is try tracking across all of our clients and our friends uh, anonymously what type, type of alerts are triggered. Plus we do a lot of research ourselves, so we constantly trigger all kinds of out-of-the-box alerts. And this can help us at least understand, okay, where is it strong, where is it weaker, so where do we need to do stuff ourselves, build detections or get an additional product. That's basically a thing. And it will never be completely blue, right? Everybody that works with, with, the, with the attack framework knows that uh, there's no, uh, there's no uh, holy grail there. And we can also start mapping the data potential. So basically we can look at what type of data components does it actually log, and what would that theoretically uh, be able to visualize for us. And then of course it's theoretically because not every attack will be visible that way, and 
not all data will be in there since it is configured and, sa and sampled. So it's, it's at least a direction. So we can understand, do we even have the potential of data for it? And basically what, you, what we did is, is map it basically to every uh, MITRE uh, uh, data component with the, the table and, uh, and the entries in there that we want to utilize. And this gives us huge potential in, in theory again, but we can cover, well, 299 techniques, which is quite a lot out of the 550-ish that they have. And we can even start visualizing it. So this is a custom Bloodhound version that we, uh, that we used, where we can see, okay, if we want to only use the registry, for instance, as a data source, what kind of techniques could we be covering here? And then we can see which event types on the, on the provider side, which is defended for endpoint, can we actually utilize. So this is a nice visual way of seeing, okay, what can I actually do with my data? But also what is important, is, so why, where does the telemetry come from on the operating system? There's, there's all kinds of ways that it can be acquired. So we started look, looking a little bit into this. And the easiest tool I could find to do this was Mimikatz, because it's just so convenient in there. But basically, we can see all the, the, the kernel callback channels that were there. Um, and I see Vincent is here, so welcome. Um, but the, the, the cool thing here is if we can see basically what, what it does, does is it tells the kernel, the driver tells the kernel, hey, if an incident like this or an event like this happens, I want to get a, uh, um, an event from it. So we can see that we see a wdfilter.sys and we see an msecflt.sys. Uh, the wdfilter is to the Windows Defender agent, so that's the AV component. And the MSEC FLT is basically the EDR component. So they, they both get their own individual data stream. And they might also look at different information there. So they, if you want to kill it or if somebody wants to kill it, they have to kill both, which is kind of nice. Um, but you, did, you don't necessarily know what they do. And you see some Sysmon in between as well uh, for the people that use that. So a lot of the stuff is the same. So they get the same telemetry, at least from the kernel. With one dif difference, though. Uh, on the process side, you can see a pre-operation and a post-operation, which technically means the pre-operation is whenever it happens, so a process creation event, and the, the post-operation is a, a process termination event. So as you can see, Sysmon does both, and the Defender product doesn't do that. So not necessarily bad, uh, unless you want to monitor for it or see how long a process lived, uh, which could be cool in an IR investigation, right? Uh, but yeah, that's something the EDR won't help you with. Um, and then the event tracing for Windows bit. It's basically the mechanism on the kernel side which generates all the raw telemetry. It's a fire hose, so don't just ingest everything. Um, and it's basically built in three layers. So you have providers, you have consumers, which basically consume what the provider gives you. And then you have a tracing session, which is sort of a consumption-based thing from a provider, but it works in a slightly different way. And basically what it does, um, what the Defender product does is it creates its own providers as well where it basically looks at itself. And these are sort of aggregation providers. So what it does is it looks at a lot of other ETW events, gets it into its own uh, stream, and then hooks on that and ships that to the, uh, to the portal. And there were, there were like, I don't know how many, eight or nine. So I, I was very interested in what, what's in there, right? Because I want to know what is actually, what, what is being logged, what it's looking at, um, to understand a little bit more what I can actually do with it. So what it does is it stores it first locally. So it's, it makes a, a subscription to the event tracing for Windows providers, gets that information, stores it in a SQLite database, and that gets flushed every time it uploads it. So there's a sort of local store and forward system to not lose any of the telemetry if the internet goes down or whatever on that machine. Um, and it's kind of funny that they, they uh, use a sort of very old um, code name uh, for that database, which is called Asimov, which is, I think, a Halo reference. But it's also uh, now uh, the, the whole Asimov project uh, was renamed into the Diac Track uh, service, which we'll come back to in a second, so keep in mind uh, that name. And basically, um, this is where it stores it. So it's not very important for the rest. It's, it's uh, signed and it's protected. So it's very really hard to tamper with that from an attacker perspective. So that's relatively safe. So then I was interested in what, what kind of telemetry is being, being generated, right? Or being captured. And 
one of the very nice tools to, to start looking at those event tracing things is, um, is CLiDAR. It's a, it's a relatively simple tool where you can just say, okay, I want to subscribe to these providers, and you can log it to either the screen or to a JSON file or even to the event log itself. So you can create your own custom feeds if you want to. Um, and as the, 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 the creator mentions, it's not as stable. I, I found it very stable, but if you want to do it at scale, maybe Silky TW or even Velociraptor might be a better way to, uh, to start hooking those. So once I started building those traces, I saw you, know, you get a very nice structured uh, data output per event. This is from the cybersecurity feed uh, or cyber events feed. And one of the things I noticed was this, this events blob, which looked like a base64 string. So I figured, okay, let's uh, just decode it. That's probably possible. And then I got this as an output, and probably you can't read it, uh, but, but this looks probably quite familiar to a lot of people, which is even in the same structure with all the ugly tabs and so on as a normal event log event from the PowerShell uh, uh, provider. So that was kind of interesting. And then there was some, some bas some, some basically some, some blobs and, and binary code around it. So it turns out that this, uh, that's Bond. It's an open source project by Microsoft where they use uh, some serialization with a schema uh, to make it more efficient to upload it and just compress the data a little bit. I couldn't find the schemas in the, in the source code of, uh, of the Defender uh, client, but I also didn't really need it because I was more after the, the telemetry generation, so I, I might dig into that later. Um, but my, my next question was basically, so hey, that PowerShell information is kind of interesting, where does it get it? So I started looking at uh, all of the providers, the ETW providers and their subscriptions on the uh, operating system. And one of the tools to use is, is the telemetry sourcer, which is another open source tool, really nice. And you can basically see the, uh, on the left side, you can see all of the providers and the subscriptions or the sessions next to it. And the PowerShell one only had one session, basically. So only the event log was actually capturing that PowerShell information. And I ran it as system, so I should be able to see everything. Um, so then my sort of assumption would be, hey, the MDE just uses the event log, right? Because I can't see a session there. So I started looking a little bit more on the underlying side. And there the die track thing comes back, which is the diagnostics tracing service from Windows, which captures a lot of information. Um, and apparently also Microsoft uses that as a vehicle to get to some of those event logs. Um, and the interesting bit was that um, the service itself is not protected, so it's just there, and every local admin can basically kill, stop, and pause it. Um, and if you do that, some of the telemetry doesn't go into the Defender portal anymore. So you, you can partially blind it. You still will have all your process creation and all the other ones that it gets from the kernel directly, but some of the event tracing for Windows traces will be sort of you know, suspended for that, for that time. So I don't know why. Uh, it used to be a protected service for quite a long time, and then for some reason, in one of the patches, uh, it it's suddenly got unprotected. So that's something I still have to validate with Microsoft, but it's interesting to know. So if somebody stops that service, that might also be a trigger for you to have a look at. So going to the configuration a little bit. So like every product, you have to tell it what to do. And uh, as I mentioned before, Microsoft maintains this. It's stored on the box. Uh, it might be a nice CDF to, uh, to find it and, and decode it, um, because I'm not going to tell you wh where it is. Um, uh, for all, all, all kinds of reasons, uh, I don't want people just, just to be able, because you can basically see everything it's tracing, uh, which is great for every offensive person or ransomware person as well. Uh, but it would be a nice exercise uh, to do so. Um, it is signed, so you can't add stuff to it or remove stuff from it. It's just a source that the process can, can uh, access. And we, so far we didn't manage to actually bypass that signing. So that, that's, it, it's, it's quite secure, but it is it's readable. And on a, on a Mac and Linux box, it's super easy because that's stored in just a JSON blob in plain text as a file. So those are easy, but the ones on the Windows box, it's, it's slightly more complicated. Um, but some examples there. So, so they configure all the ETW events and the registry keys, the file paths is monitoring, and so on. All kinds of exclusions, the filters that they apply to it, which process names are whitelisted, 
a lot of stuff. And then the, the, the very important one is the capping. So they do a global cap and a local cap. So the global cap is basically, I only want 5,000 PowerShell events for that day. And then the local cap might be, I only want one PowerShell event a day that uh, was spawned by this process and this command line and some, some of the other ones. So it's basically trimmed down a little bit. Then they also do a lot of dynamic data collection. So they have all kinds of PowerShell scripts that they run to see uh, which, uh, which Wi-Fi connections you have stored on your box or which services are running, all kinds of dynamic data collection. Then the config of the agent itself, so how often should it upload, what are the quotas, um, if, if there's a low latency connection or a high latency connection, it, it also trims down the volume of the data that it will upload. So it will be a little bit dynamic uh, from that perspective. And that config is huge. It's like probably over 75K lines by now. So it grows over time. Um, and we also monitor that to see what they're actually including, excluding, these kind of things. Uh, we can see all the ETW providers and the events within it that it's, uh, it's grabbing. There's like 500 registry paths that it's monitoring. Um, and, and all those data collection ones is like 60 scripts. It's quite a lot. Um, so this is just a random snippet of it. It's a very lengthy list, as I mentioned before. So this is an interesting one, the Threat Intelligence Provider, which is a, a Windows native ETW event that is only accessible to um, um, basically approved, um, uh, what is it, the ELAM drive, so the early load ma malware analysis uh, driver. It's slightly like different, but you get the drift. Um, so Microsoft allows you to, uh, to get access to that or not. So most, most AV and EDR vendors have it. And what's in there is like process suspension events, process resume, um, some, some virtual alloc calls, some, some, a set of API calls that it can monitor. The PowerShell command lines, we actually seen that one, right, in, this, in the example before. And I saw Secure ETW, which, which kind of looked funny to me because it, the name is very different, but yeah, it says secure, so it must be interesting. So I started looking at that, and what, what I did first is I looked up the provider, GUID, so it's, uh, everything has a global unique ID. Um, and with Logman, which is a native Windows tool, you can just query it and see what it's actually called. So it turns out it's just a security log. So from there, I started looking at, hey, what, what's actually in that security log? Which events is it tailing? So for instance, it, it checks the 4624, which most people would know as the log on success. And then we can also see uh, a couple of things. So we can see the events or the fields that it's making that, that local cap on, right? So there's a cap of one. If a specific user with a specific domain name, with a specific SID and a specific logon type from a specific IP uh, has a specific target logon ID. So that, that whole set of things would be one event per day. So if I use a different IP with the same other variables, it will be a new event. And there's a thousand in total that will, would get logged. And then there's a, a bunch of field configurations, so basically all the fields that would get shipped to the portal. Um, so then I was interested, okay, it tells the security event log, which events is it actually looking for. And it's quite a lengthy list, as you can see. Uh, you don't have to go through it all. But basically what I then did, so I know from a security log, is that sometimes you need to enable some of those events, right? Because uh, out of the box, it's pretty bad. So there's a couple of things that you can do. I have to speed up, I, may, I know this, so if, if I'm going too fast, just wave. Uh, but basically what you can do with the audit policies is you can set nothing and then it doesn't audit. Uh, you can say it's only on the successful field and, and on both. So for most of those events that we just saw, we can actually know what setting does it require to get logs. So I started mapping that and then I started looking at um, uh, what is on a default out of the box Windows box. So from that whole list, uh, and most of them are grayed out that are actually fine, but all the white ones remain as out of the box, not logged, but required by the EDR, or at least preferred uh, by the EDR. And there's some, some interesting ones in there, like service creation um, and, and scheduled tasks, which are probably two of the most used attack factors. Um, so there, it's blind to that by default. But fortunately, uh, the Defender team was also aware of this, so they enable a bunch of those, but they still don't enable all of them. Um, and there's a couple of reasons, because as you can see, you see the firewall one, and you see, uh, uh, I don't know, the vault credentials, which isn't that noisy, but especially the firewall one, most people would know that that's like a fire hose. 
So you might not want to have that enabled on all your servers that are also shipping to Splunk or Sentinel or something else and then get flooded by all kinds of data because you enabled EDR. So this is the reason why they don't enable that. Sadly, they also don't document that they don't enable that, which you have to sort of find out now uh, or by yourself. So that, that's kind of sh sh shitty. Sorry for my language, but um, that, that's, yeah, that, that's not good. So at least have a check in your environment, and that's also something to know. So they enable, they enable a couple of them, right? Service creation, for instance. You probably have that in your GPO already. Um, but if you have something else in your GPO and they enable it, the GPO will just override that and then it's gone again. So be aware what you actually have set in your, uh, in your GPOs. And um, uh, to help you out, I, I built a very bad PowerShell script, but it basically gets all the GPOs, sees where there's an audit event, and if it isn't enabled, it will tell you, or if it's not in the right setting. So I have a, have a check there, so I have to almost wrap up. There we go. Um, so just to conclude, so really try to understand if you use a tool, how it works, where it's strong, where it's bad, because then you can actually uh, address that. Um, and try to reassess this, because tools like these evolve over time. They constantly get improved or sometimes worsened. Um, so you can then augment it with uh, an additional tool just to improve your telemetry and make the full use of it. And with that, I think we have time for questions. Absolutely, so there is a microphone in front. Please do ask question. We have a couple of minutes left. I think it was uh, very good to see uh, some insights and tricks and trips that, that uh, you can uh, give us uh, so that uh, people can be aware of these details. Yeah, one of the things I'm working on now, if there's no questions, I'll just talk on. Yes, um, probably. <laughs> is, uh, a few more minutes. Um, one of the things I, I started doing, because one of the, the most annoying features is that they, most of the time they, they restrict the amount of telemetry, but for the, the DLL loads, it's completely random. There's really no logic behind it, so you just get events, maybe, or not. So what I started doing now is starting an open source project with a Defender Application Control policy that is in audit only mode for the DLLs that I actually care about. Uh, so that at least that telemetry gets generated and that will also show up in the portal. So that's just a, a sort of cheap hack to get rid of some of that other uh, 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 limitations. Sir. There is a question down there. Yes. Yes, it's working. Thank you. Thank you for this presentation. I was just wondering, is there uh, documentation from Microsoft on this? I'm not a client for Microsoft. No, no, that's sadly, the, on the, at least on the blind spots with the uh, security uh, audit settings, there is no documentation. So the only thing, I, I couldn't find it at least, and I, I Googled and I searched on the Microsoft website. I haven't seen it. Um, there used to be something only around the firewall events, but the rest is just, okay. it's not there, sadly, no. I have the same issues with my own provider. Yeah, it's a shame, right? Because if they, if they want to have the telemetry, it makes the product better. So uh, you would figure they would at least tell you to enable it to yeah. make the product, their own product, uh, proceed as a better product. So yeah. it's. Uh, and as you say, you would better understand how the product is working and how. Yeah. Uh, where it cannot w work uh, and where you have to put specific things around. Exactly. Yeah. That, that, that they don't publish their own configuration like the one that I reversed. I can imagine because that's helping attackers. But this is just enabling your your whole work fleet of at least generating the right telemetry, which yeah, that should be that should be documented. Period. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the question, and let's thank all for the very insightful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So we have 10 minutes to either change the room or stay here and uh, stretch a little bit and then in 10 minutes we will start the next presentation.